we're feeling very nomadic in this video because we boondocked in three different places for five nights. We didn't really have a schedule, so we just sort of looked ahead in the map a couple hours and said, hey, let's go check here and let's go check there. One of the things we ended up doing is backtracking. It was a lot of fun to do whatever we wanted to do. Yeah, very freeing. I hope you enjoy what we put together. We are near Las Cruces, New Mexico. There is the recycled Roadrunner, and we decided to pull over and take some pictures. As DeWitt would say, here we are. We're at the giant recycled Roadrunner. It's made out of different recycled parts. David pointed out we can see some crutches in there. Yes. I can't remember what else is in there, but. I saw the crutches. Even has a little eyeball looking at us. Yes, it does. I think this is close as we can get. I don't think we can walk up to it. Yeah, there's a ravine between us and it. This is a really nice view. Not just the recycled Roadrunner, but the entire view. And we're thinking this might be our overnight stop tonight. Las Cruces is down there in the distance. morning. It turned out to be a really nice spot, so we just decided to stay the night. We slept with a roadrunner. <laughs> and here's our view this morning when we woke up. You might be asking, well, did we have any company? We definitely had some couple semis, but we ended up having at least two Tiffins park near us. One guy parked right behind us, and he had a pup, so we ended up moving so it's easier for them to get out to the dog walk area overnight. And we had an Allegra Red in the parking behind us as well. Pistachio land, where the world's largest pistachio lives, right behind me. And in just a few minutes, we're going to take a tour of the farm. That'll be exciting. They grow pistachios and I think some other nuts, and they also grow grapes because they also have a vineyard here. We are officially off like a herd of turtles. <laughs> Just in case you guys missed it, there's a huge 30-foot pistachio here. It is built entirely out of concrete and steel, and then painted to resemble our illustrious pistachio. You guys are probably wondering what it possesses to build that huge thing. Well, obvious reasons to lure people like you in. No, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Mr. Tom again was a, um, very much a go big or go home kind of guy. And he was also responsible for introducing the pistachio to southern New Mexico. This is the beginnings of our 12 and a half acre, six variety vineyard. This machine coming up here, uh, this thing is our original employee torture device. <laughs> so this is our original wine press. Everything had to be destemmed by hand, tossed into that central barrel. Then it would take four guys roughly about uh, three hours to manually crank that sucker down only to yield maybe about 100 gallons of juice. With our newer equipment, we actually have a machine that destems everything for us. We literally shovel it into the new wine press where it's hydraulically compressed. In about a half hour, we have almost triple the yield. So half the labor, triple the yield. That's like my favorite math equation. Now, if you look from the ground up, you will notice a very distinctive bark color and texture change. That is because every single pistachio tree grown in the west and the southwest today is actually grafted onto what's called a UCB1. All of these trees are believed to have originated in Syria. In their native countries, these trees can actually live three to four 
hundred years. This is a male tree. Look at all those little bumpy little pine cone looking things coming out of the nodes on all the branches there. Those are the very early stages of flower buds. We do have male trees and we have female trees. The females produce a fruit, not a nut. The females are also all wind pollinated. So birds and insects have absolutely nothing to do with the pollination of these trees. The wind does all the work and they'll actually start to pop open their own shells. So we don't do it, the trees actually do it for us. So there's some, I guess, some pods still on these mm -hmm. trees? Yeah. Are those the, the unharvested? The odds are that those are completely hollow. All right, because the female, she can produce the colorful outer hull, she can produce the shell, but if they don't get pollinated, then they're completely hollow. That's why you have to have both to produce uh, the fruit. Which one did you get? Garlic and honey. How is it? Pretty. I think I like traditional bear. What you gonna try this time? I'm not big on spice, but I, think I should at least try the red chili and the green chili. Ones. All right. Three's enough. Green's better. Like spicy enough, we should go get our water. Yeah. Okay. All right, Debbie. No, no. You have to try dill pickle pistachios for Natalie. No, I don't. I really don't. <laughs> I'm going for cinnamon. out some pistachio wine. I'm gonna read it. It's called Pistachio Delight, a signature wine with a sweet and fruity pistachio infused blush wine. I like it. I'm not much of a wine drinker, so sweet wines are good. This is good for me. I'm not a big wine drinker, and so I was told to try the pomegranate wine, and it might give a little bit different taste. So here goes. Still not a wine drinker. This is Emilio. Howdy, folks. <laughs> he helped us get packages sent to our parents. We sent them some ranch flavored pistachios, some regular flavored pistachios, and some habanero limon. <laughs> habanero limon? Oh, that's what he said. <laughs> you gotta add that little twang to it. <laughs> <laughs> we bought a bag of ranch flavored for ourselves. Yes. These guys are three years old. Well, how long does it take for them to produce nuts? It takes them five years to produce anything, and they're not guaranteed to produce every year. will go to get you the pictures and videos for Shelly's Nest. The things I'll do to get pictures for you guys. Enough monkeying around, it's time to go. That's right, Daddy, come on. Water came up, and so that's Bellhorn, El Paso, and so we are right here. 
There's a reef somewhere that has lots of fossils in it. We're in a museum and they have a prairie dog on display. Coyote. Badger. And its favorite bird, a red-tailed hawk. Standing in front of a corner section of the old Pinery Station. What is the Pinery Station? It was a stop along the way for the first Overland Mail Route. The Butterfield Overland Mail Route was the first route connecting mail from the east to the west. It came from St. Louis, Missouri to San Francisco, California. The stagecoaches that were used to carry the mail carried about 12,000 pieces of mail, but they also carried up to nine passengers. The stagecoaches traveled 120 miles per day. The whole trip was 2,700 miles. The contract with the post office was for the mail to be delivered in 25 days. That's really interesting because the mail from the east to the west used to go on ships all the way around South America. Can you imagine nowadays that 25 days is your express mail? The Overland Mail Route was highly used between September of 1858 to August of 1859. The mail route was great. Everybody loved that it was so fast, but it did have to come to an end with the Civil War. This is what the station looked like back in 1858. This piece right here is the part of the wall that is still standing with a little help. New Mexico, BLM land. It's basically a big square parking lot with trash dumpster. Carlsbad Caverns about 30 miles that way. Guadalupe National Park's that way, off to the west. Expecting some strong winds tonight through the next two days, up to 50 or 60 miles an hour. So according to the Windy app, we'll be facing into the wind. We parked for the day. We're only gonna be here a day or two, so we were too lazy to turn the chairs around but that does not stop DeWitt from relaxing. I want to sit here and watch the weather. It's starting to rain and we're expecting the 40 and 50 mile an hour gusts in a couple hours. So I'm gonna watch see if it changes from rain to snow. Moo moo. Hey, moo. Moo ya. I guess I got someplace else to go. They probably feel the storms coming. They're gonna go find a place out of the wind. I know you guys are really tired of hearing the wind on our channel, so I'm gonna show it to you. It might not seem like much. The wind is 30 miles an hour with gusts up to 49 miles an hour per AccuWeather. However, the way that this RV is rocking and shaking, the winds are much higher than 49 mile an hour gusts. You probably can't see the wind blowing behind us because of our big heads in the window, but <laughs> it's blowing. We had an interesting night. There's going to be high winds coming through the area for the next two days. So we had already picked out some BLM land. We faced into the wind, but even so, starting around by 8 o'clock last night, the wind just started picking up and rocking. So we pulled in the big slide so that the awning that covers it wouldn't get ripped up in the wind. Around midnight, we pulled in the tiny slide and the RV was just shaking and rocking and the wind was starting to come on the side, so we turned the RV a little bit more. Luckily with BLM land, we got plenty of space to move around. <laughs> we are uh, facing nose into the wind. It's just shaking the RV back and forth. It is. I mean, people could say, oh, you know, last night was like a boat on the ocean, but it wasn't that calm. <laughs> <laughs> The Windy app that I use was saying the gusts were hitting 65 and almost 70 miles an hour. It's our first experience of this kind of wind, so we're enjoying it. We had trouble sleeping last night for the first little bit. I think we both just realized that 
we're not going anywhere. The wind's not going <laughs> to blow us over since we're facing into it. We fell asleep and actually had a pretty good night's sleep last couple hours. Yeah, the last couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait till you can see your hair. going inside Carlsbad Cavern along the Switchback Trail here. We made it to the big room. We walked one and a quarter miles straight down into the cavern along all the switchbacks. We got down here, we're gonna explore this in just a little bit, but right now we're waiting for a guided tour of King's Palace. So that should be very exciting. All of it's very exciting. That's the doors to the elevator. just finished the tour of the King's Palace and so we're wrapping up the tour of the big room we head it back out it is pretty impressive so if you get time to do it definitely set aside several hours you don't have to rush so the visitor center is up here which is where we are right now to get down to the cavern we walked to the natural entrance which was a mile and a quarter See all those zigzags? That was us. The big room that DeWitt showed you, another mile and a quarter that we walked. We found animals on the side of the mountain, but we're not really sure what they are. Mountain lions. <laughs> 